All right. Thank you, Gabby. Okay, so we're going to talk to everybody today. We're going to talk a little bit about the mechanics of the H2A guest worker program and some trends that have been happening in the program. And then we're going to talk about how the pandemic has really affected H2A guest workers and give you guys some specific strategies to do outreach to H2A workers in your community. Go ahead, Gabby. So Gabby and Edis are both with Farmer for Justice. Farmer for Justice is based in Washington, D.C., and they are a nonprofit that seeks to empower farm workers to improve their living and working conditions, their immigration status, their health and safety, and their access to justice. Go ahead, Gabby. I'm with NCFH, like Mario, and we are based in Central Texas, and our mission is to improve the health status of farm worker families. And Dr. Jennifer Scott is also here with us, and she is based at Louisiana State University. Go ahead, Gabby. Okay, so in the chat, you guys should see uh, the link to the poll questions. I put in two poll questions in there. So the, the first one I put in there is, have you served or worked with H-2A workers? And the third is if you think the number of H2A workers in your state is increasing, decreasing, or staying about the same over the past few years. I'm assuming that everybody's heard of the H2A program and that's probably why they're in this session. So I'll give everybody about 30 seconds to go ahead and answer that, that question. And it looks like right now about about 60% of you have worked with H2A workers. 75% of you think that the number of H2A workers is increasing in your area. About 30% say it's staying the same. Nobody is saying that it's decreasing. Okay, great. Well, this is so exciting. So before we kind of dive into the mechanics and some of the numbers about the program, I really wanted to, uh, you know, put a human face on this presentation and introduce you to an H2A worker if you've never, never worked with H2A workers before. So on this slide is uh, Diego Sanchez. He really, I was really hoping he could call into this session, but his internet connection in Mexico just isn't good enough for, for Zoom calls. So he recorded these uh, two clips here. And so we can go ahead and show those. And I will give you... Um, uh, a little bit more information about him before we dive into some of the research. So Gabby, if you could please share this first clip in Spanish and I will summarize what he says in English. Obviamente del estado de Veracruz. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo han estado? Mi nombre es Diego Sánchez. Soy originario y vecino de un lugar llamado Santa Rosa, en el veracruzano municipio de Iztaxoquitlán, obviamente del estado de Veracruz. Thank you, Gabby. So to summarize briefly, so Diego just said, if you can stay on that slide, Gabby, thank you. Diego just said that he's uh, from the state of Veracruz, from a, a town called Santa Rosa. And so Diego is a former H2A guest worker. His training, he's a civil engineer. He's worked on construction projects in Mexico and the Dominican Republic. He also produces um, coffee and sugar cane with his family, and he's also a musician. So he wanted to briefly share this other short um, clip on the bottom right, Gabby, if you can play that one. Me fui con el hacendado, señor traigo una tratada. Quiero que me dé un caballo por mi yegua colorada. ¿Qué caballo es el que quieres? Me contesta el hacendado. Un potro lobo gateado que ayer mire en el corral. Que charros y caporales no lo han podido amansar. Thank you. So he's, he's, a great, he's a great person. I've been lucky to know him. Um, Diego is on an advisory council for one of our projects here at NCFH. And something really great about his story is that he came to the US for the first time last year on an H-2A visa to harvest pumpkins. So he came here in August, 2020. 
And within a few days of arriving, he, he started getting COVID-19 symptoms. His, uh, his employer actually took him to get tested. He tested positive and he was put back into a room with five other guys, um, actually indigenous uh, Mexicans from the state of Michoacan. And they were all together in a hotel room, uh, a lot in a larger hotel complex with about a hundred workers. So what happened to Diego is that the employer left him and Diego's symptoms got worse and worse and worse. And he was having a lot of trouble breathing. And the employer told him that he was faking it, that he didn't want to work and refused to take him to the hospital. So he was getting quite desperate and he was in communication with his sister back in Veracruz. And she is quite Facebook savvy and found the Dalhart Facebook page, which was the town that Diego was in and posted on their buy and sell group. Hey, my brother's there. He needs medical help. And she was able to connect with a local resident who figured out where Diego was staying and called 911. So this is a great story because it, it highlights that, you know, it's not just low literacy levels or issues like that that can really limit an H2A worker's access to health care. It's just, um, you know, it, it underscores the importance of doing outreach to H2A workers because if their employer doesn't give them the information, then it's really up to us to give them the, the appropriate information. All right, next slide. And somebody asked where Diego was working. He was working in Texas, in North Texas. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the H2A program, if you're not familiar with it, it allows, sorry, I had my time. It allows um, temporary employment of foreign agricultural workers if there aren't enough US workers available for, to work on the farms. And if the wages and working conditions of those workers in the US are not gonna be adversely impacted. So this is a program where it's a non-immigrant visa, meaning they can't get residency, they can't get citizenship, they're just here to work on a temporary basis. And those visas they get are tied to the employers that sponsored the visa. And in turn, employers are required to provide a wage at a threshold that's different for every state. They have to provide housing for the workers. They have to provide workers' comp insurance. And they must pay for the transportation to and from the country of origin. So that's some of the basics. And now I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Scott to talk a little bit about some of the trends in the program. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Bethany, and thank you all for joining us. I'm going to talk about the recent trends we've seen in the H2A program over the last decade or so. So as you can see in this chart, the H2A program has seen substantial growth since about 2012. We've seen over 2 million positions certified since 2006. In this graph, you see using we used employer reported data from the Office of Foreign Labor Certification to track the number of positions certified. You can see that the number of positions certified really began increasing since 2010. In initial analyses of these data um, that Bethany and I are conducting, we've been trying to understand this trend in relation to employer numbers. So from our preliminary analysis, it seems that parallel to the increase in total number of visas, we're seeing an increase in the mean number of positions certified by employers. Um, so this is increasing up to about 2018. So it's suggesting that the overall total increase in positions certified may be more due to increasing numbers of positions per employers rather than an increasing number of employers entering the workforce. In 2020, total number of 275,000 H3 positions were certified. Next slide. So who are H2A farm workers? We know that about 94% of H2A workers are men. Um, from anecdotal evidence that we've known that uh, women are often told that H2A jobs are only available to men, though that's not the case. Um, and then the vast majority of farm workers, about 96%, come from Mexico, with other top sending countries being Jamaica, Canada, South Africa, and Guatemala. Next slide. 
Here you can see a map of the distribution of where H2A workers are coming from. As I mentioned previously, the darker red shows where the majority of workers are coming from. The countries I mentioned like Mexico, also Central America with Guatemala and South Africa and Jamaica. The lighter color is a, a, a slightly less, but we're still receiving working. In 2020, you can see by this graph that the uh, majority of H2 or the highest numbers of H2A workers were um, in Florida and Georgia, which is under 40,000 worker positions certified in Florida. Next slide. And then the final trend I really want to talk about is we also looked at the trends in certification by employer in these same analyses using the employer reported data um, by region. Um, so trying to get an understand how the mean number of workers being certified by employer was changing over the last decade um, regionally. From here, you can see that there are a higher number a higher mean number of positions certified um, by employer in the Northwest and Pacific before 2017, but that seems to be decreasing. And then the recent increase in mean number of visas per employer in the heartland and the upper Midwest. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Gabby, who's gonna talk us more about H2A worker protections. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, one second. So as Bethany was saying, the H-2A uh, Agricultural Guest Worker Program is tied to all of the protections within it are tied to protections for U.S. workers. So that starts with the wage floor. Um, and the wage floor is set based on the highest of the adverse effect wage rate, the prevailing wage, the federal or state minimum wage, or the collective bargaining wage. And for a variety of reasons, the adverse effect wage rate often is the highest of, of those four wages. And so it ends up frequently being the floor for both H-2A workers and domestic workers who are working um, for the same employer in corresponding employment. Um, and the adverse effect wage rate is set by the DOL every year based on data that's collected by the um, United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, 2021 adverse effect wage rates were just released a few weeks ago, um, and it turns out they increased in every state across the country, ranging from about $11.88 to a little over $16 per hour. Um, the next set of protections that exist for workers are uh, protections for domestic workers. So there are recruitment obligations on any H-2A employer who brings in H-2A workers. Um, they need to satisfy a few recruitment requirements to ensure that domestic workers are also being notified of these jobs. That includes posting job offers on um, specific websites that are um, set up by the government, and then also doing some specific versions of advertisement and reaching out to previous uh, domestic workers. There's also the 50% rule, which states that uh, H-2A employers um, must offer employment to any domestic worker who is qualified and available and who applies during the first half of the season. So if a season, if you're Michigan cherry season, and it starts in the middle of July and runs until the end of August, and a domestic worker shows up to apply for a job on that, um, for that employer, the employer has to offer them a position up until, you know, August 7th, halfway through the season. There are also recruitment protections for H-2A workers. So the three-fourths guarantee requires that employers um, who offer a certain number of hours on the job order have to uh, offer three-fourths of those hours to H-2A workers who show up uh, for the job. So if a job offer says that there are going to, that the work week is going to be 40 hours per week and there will be six weeks of work, that's 240 hours total. And that means that the employer has to offer three-fourths of that. So 180 hours of work. Um, and if they can't offer that, then they need to pay the difference. Uh, that has a couple of purposes. One is to ensure that employers do not um, overhire and then intentionally uh, you know, suppress wages by overhiring. Um, and it also uh, protects H-2A workers who often travel very long distances for their jobs um, by requiring that that job actually exist when they arrive. 
There are also travel reimbursement requirements. So H-2A employers must uh, reimburse the travel costs um, of workers for arriving um, after one half of the season has been completed. And then after the worker completes the entire season, the employer has to cover the cost of returning home. And finally, there are housing requirements. So H-2A employers have to provide housing to all H-2A workers and any domestic workers who are not able to return home at the end of the night. And there are specific requirements about you know, the quality of housing and, and what must be included in that housing. Um, outside of the H-2A regulations, there are a number of other ways that H-2A workers are protected. So I know that um, federally funded legal aid programs are often limited in who they may represent and for what purposes. Um, federally funded legal aid programs are permitted to serve uh, H-2A workers. H-2A workers are also protected by the Fair Labor Standards Act, as well as state contract and employment laws. Um, the H-2A program regulations themselves are enforced by the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division. Um, and uh, employers and contractors who repeatedly violate those regulations can technically be barred from bringing in future H-2A workers. And finally, H-2A workers are not currently covered by the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act, which is one of the key laws that protects agricultural workers. Um, although there, there are efforts to, to change that and broaden um, the coverage of APA, the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act. And then very briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, occupational safety and health protections for workers during COVID. So OSHA a few weeks ago released new guidance on um, what steps employers must take to protect workers for, uh, from COVID. I misspoke. Those are not requirements, I'm sorry. Um, they re they uh, released a guidance saying that employers are responsible for providing a safe and healthy workplace free from recognized harms likely to cause death or serious physical harm, but they did not make these requirements. Instead, they are best practices um, so those best practices include hazard assessments, um, specific measures to limit the spread of COVID, like providing PPE and enforcing social distancing, um, non-punitive policies to allow workers to stay home if they are sick, um, paid sick leave, which again, it's not required, but um, the American Rescue Plan did create uh, funding for, to reimburse employers who choose to provide paid sick leave. They don't have to, but if they choose to, they can seek reimbursement for those costs. Um, and then a set of states have also imposed uh, specific requirements for what agricultural employers must do to protect farm workers from COVID-19. Um, a lot of states have some sort of standard. Maybe it does cover agricultural workers. Maybe it doesn't. Um, these five states, California, Michigan, Oregon, Virginia, and Washington, have specific standards that cover um, agricultural workers. Uh, so California has specific standards for what must happen in the workplace, as well as standards for housing and transportation. Things like this is how far apart beds need to be, and these are the, this is the sort of ventilation that's necessary. Um, Michigan has specific testing requirements as well as reporting requirements, and it also requires that any employer who provides housing uh, must provide quarantine housing. Um, Oregon also has a set of um, standards, and they previously had uh, standards covering transportation for farm workers, but those expired in October and have not been extended. Um, Virginia was the first state to impose requirements for how employers must respond to COVID-19. And they have sort of a broad sliding scale of how different employers who, you know, employ workers in different sectors need to respond to COVID. So Virginia has identified uh, agricultural work as a moderate risk. And so employers need to take moderate steps to protect workers from COVID-19. And finally, Washington has some relatively broad standards for protecting agricultural workers. And um, I believe that they have recently enforced that, uh, uh, those standards against um, employers who were not abiding by them. And now I'm going to turn it over to my coworker, Edis, to discuss um, what makes H-2A workers particularly vulnerable to COVID. 
Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, um, as the case may be. Um, so talking about COVID, um, there's various factors that make H2A work Workers particularly vulnerable, um, and farm workers in general. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, farm workers often work in close proximity to each other, and they may have limited access to hand washing stations and sanitation supplies. Um, they are often transported in shared vehicles to the fields um, and from housing to the fields. Um, and some farm workers, including, of course, H2A workers, live in employer-controlled housing. So that presents um, another set of challenges in terms of the COVID risk. Many um, are not native English speakers, and some speak only indigenous languages. Uh, many farm workers have continued to report even a year after um, the pandemic really um, started reaching its peak here in the US, that their employers do not provide them with adequate information, masks, hand washing facilities, hygienic supplies, or the opportunity for social distancing, either during transportation or in the fields. Next slide, please. Yet yeah, even before COVID, there were many barriers to general healthcare access that of course have been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. Workers often have limited access to clinics um, and H2A workers are often even more isolated than the general farm worker population because they've been brought in from the foreign country to an area that they might not be familiar with um, as opposed to workers who, who may have been in that area or in that community for some time. Um, they are reliant on their employer for transportation um, and there's fears of immigration enforcement, which might seem counterintuitive because they're here on visas. However, uh, there's of course the fear of retaliation in the form of immigration enforcement because the visa is controlled by the employer. Workers may also be re reluctant to go to a doctor or to access medical care because of practical reasons such as concern about the cost of the visit or the treatment. Um, a lack of trust of the healthcare provider or the outreach worker, um, also a preference for use of traditional medicine and home remedies. Um, and then there's also the communication piece of it. Um, it might be hard to communicate or understand due to language barriers or education and literacy levels. Next slide, please. So not surprisingly, um, given this reality, we have seen a, a, a devastating effect of the COVID pandemic on farm workers. Um, there's a Purdue University tracker that estimates that more than 500,000 agricultural workers have contracted COVID-19. Um, and all, although the data we have, as well as multiple accounts from workers themselves, have shown the devastating impact of the pandemic, we are still likely underestimating it uh, because most health departments are not gathering data on COVID-19 rates by occupation. Um, and so this data that we have on this slide is actually from independent studies and surveys that have been done um, on, on certain um, sectors in California and other states. Um, and they show a very clear increase in mortality during the time of the pandemic uh, for food and agricultural workers. My apologies to the interpreter. Um, I'm a fast speaker, so I will, I will slow down a bit. Um, so they've shown a 39% increase in mortality among food and agricultural workers, and an even higher increase in mortality among Latino food and agricultural workers. Um, and the surveys that have been done also have shown other impacts beyond the health impacts, including lost income, difficulty paying for food during the pandemic, extra burdens uh, for childcare, um, and the cost or lack of insurance as, significant, as a significant barrier. I do want to briefly mention, because I, I just saw some questions in the chat, about um, provision of health insurance. Um, so farm workers generally um, have, there, there's a very low rate of ag employers providing health insurance as an option for their workers. According to, to the data that we have, it's less than about a fifth. And so that is a challenge for farm workers more broadly 
um, as was stated before, the H-2A program does require workers' compensation. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of outreach, uh, we did wanna just quickly walk you through uh, the new website that the Department of Labor has. Uh, some of you who have been working in this uh, for a while might have been familiar with the ICERT website, which was the website that was in place uh, for many years. Um, and so now the Department of Labor has done sort of a technological revamp. Um, and this, this is the new website. Um, and this, this can be a useful tool for finding out uh, what when when H2A workers are in your state um, and the number and the location um, to help you to plan your outreach. Um, so the website is seasonaljobs.dol.gov. Next slide, please. Um, and so as you can just see from the screen, you can plug in uh, the state or area where you are and it will pull up uh, the agricultural jobs that are available um, for, what, for whatever date you put in. Um, and then if you see on the lower right-hand side, it says view job order. So if you click on that, Gabby, next slide, please. Then it'll pull up the specific job order. So some of the information that's on there includes the number of workers um, in that job order and also the dates. Um, and so I, I know for many folks who do outreach, they prefer to, to try and do that outreach as early during the period um, that workers are gonna be there as possible so that they know that they can be a resource to them during their stay there. Um, and so that can be very helpful information to have. Next slide. Thank you. Um, and so you can also get some more detailed information about, about the location of the work site. Next slide, please. Um, so when doing outreach, um, and, and I'll talk about this a little bit further on uh, when we talk about local partnerships, there's different approaches in, in different states um, and different levels of collaboration between healthcare providers and legal services providers and other service providers um, in terms of doing their outreach together or referring issues that they might see to those other providers. Um, and so for those situations, for example, medical legal partnerships or other arrangements where folks are partnering with legal services providers, um, these are some potential questions um, to ask H2A workers um, to see if there are perhaps some of these issues that might need to be addressed beyond just the healthcare issues. Um, so how many years uh, they've worked as an H2A worker, where they're from, um, did they have to pay someone in their home country in order to receive the job? And just to be clear, recruitment fees are illegal under the program, but we know um, just anecdotally and from working with legal services organizations that that doesn't mean it, it doesn't happen. Um, making sure that the worker has, the, has received the work contract or work order. Um, questions about making sure that they're being paid the promised wage, the promised amount of hours, and also questions related to occupational health and safety. It's particularly an issue that comes up a lot with farm workers is pesticides. So making sure that workers know, um, have received a, a safety training and know um, who to report an injury to. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as well as information about um, meals and housing conditions, et cetera. Um, and of course, and uh, I think this, this is, is not a surprise. It, it can take time to build trust with H2A workers. So many outreach workers do return visits. Next slide, please. So talking about um, 
identifying local partners. These are some of the, of the local partnerships um, that can be helpful to reach out to H2A workers, whether it's workforce development office, migrant education, religious groups, or farm worker legal services. <clears throat> and we have a map on our website that provides um, state by state summaries um, that has links to the farm worker legal services providers in each state um, if folks are, are interested in looking into that. Next slide, please. Um, so of course, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of social determinants of health. And so addressing some of these underlying needs um, is not, should, we view it as something that should not just be a goal of legal services or, or other partners, um, but also of healthcare providers to be able to improve workers' overall health. Um, the reality is that medical providers, especially, this is often the case, but I think even more acutely so during the pandemic where contact may have decreased from some of the other organizations, medical providers may be the only contact that H2A workers have. Um, so it's very important to make sure to maximize um, that contact. Um, H2A workers do not qualify for public benefits except for emergency Medicaid. They do, however, um, qualify for the ACA, and we also have some resources on that with more details. Um, and I know that there's some organizations on the ground that have done enrollment of H2A workers um, into ACA in the past as well. And so one example of this is in Michigan where community health workers and farm worker legal services work together to make uh, visit camps and make referrals. Next slide, please. Um, so we do want to see if folks have questions. Um, I don't know if maybe the moderator wants to ask them from the chat because I know a lot of them were coming in and it's a little hard to keep track while we're speaking. Yeah, so folks, I've been trying to type in the chat as we go about a lot of the questions that have come up, but um, please feel free to add them again if, if there's some that we've missed or Gabby or, or um, Edis, if there's any that we want to go over verbally. So I did see, just scrolling through, there was a question on the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. Um, so just so everybody's on the same page, that is a legislative proposal um, that has just passed in the House. Um, and it's just a proposal, first of all. I want to clarify that because, unfortunately, we've seen in the past when there's been legislative action that some folks uh, might pretend to be notarios or lawyers and provide immigration services for workers for, for things that have not passed yet. Um, so I wanna clarify that right off the bat. Um, but what the bill does do is it provides a path to legalization for currently undocumented workers. And it also makes some reforms to the H-2A program. Um, so the question asked about expansion of the H-2A program in the bill. So I just want to clarify, uh, as it stands right now, the H-2A program is uncapped, meaning there's no limit on the number of workers that can be brought in, into the U.S. And as we've all seen from the poll questions, that number has been increasing uh, exponentially during the last decade. Um, the bill is a compromise that has bipartisan support, including uh, 30 Republican votes in the House, for example. It does include opening up the program to year-round industry, which is not the case right now, but that, that portion of it is capped uh, to a certain limited number of visas. And that's one side of the compromise. The other side of the compromise is codifying a lot of these protections that we've been talking about which are currently just in regulation and in past administration, our organization and many other organizations have had to fight very hard uh, just to keep those protections. So those would be codified legislatively um, in addition to some new protections such as coverage under the APA that Gabby mentioned. Um, so, um, so we do have a fact sheet on it in English and Spanish that we can probably put in the link if folks want to look a little bit more detailed into some of the provisions of the bill. And there was a great question about H-2A workers, you know, being required 
to get a COVID vaccine before starting work, or maybe if they're required to get tested. They're currently not required to get tested. They're currently, some every state is doing it differently. So I have heard of some employers in some states starting to require the vaccine, but on a federal level, they're not, they're not required to get the vaccine. Right, and so we did advocate at the federal level for them to be prioritized, but, but as I'm sure folks are aware, it's very state by state and even by locality. Another fact sheet that we have on our website in case it's helpful to folks is a summary of, of the vaccine allocation and where farm workers are in that. Uh, that's broken down state by state if folks are interested um, and more information on that. Um, sorry, I'm just seeing on my chat. So so just to be clear, um, the United Farm Workers, PICUN, which is another farm worker union, Centro de los Derechos del Migrante, that um, their worker committee support Farmer First Modernization Act. There are farm worker groups that don't. Um, I would just caution against the assumption that because uh, a group does not agree <laughs> with your stance on a bill, they are any less representative of farm workers. So I just I just feel that I need to say that and we should try and keep the dialogue constructive. There's also a question about health screening and vaccines. Um, so we did send uh, various letters regarding COVID and H2A workers specifically, uh, because in addition to the, the general issues that farm workers face, for H2A workers, of course, they're having that travel into the US, which is a slightly different uh, piece than it is for other farm workers. Um, and so we've been advocating again for vaccination prioritization. Unfortunately, under the previous administration, there was not a lot of federal coordination uh, on those issues, we're hoping um, to see a different approach. Um, but again, it's still sort of the rollout is, is still in early stages. And so there is not a federal uh, mandate right now in terms of that. There's another great uh, question about recruitment, about recruitment of H2A workers in their countries of origin. And uh, Gabby and Indias may want to want to chime in on this. I think there's a variety of strategies, and I'm more familiar with how it works in Mexico than than other places. But um, it is often very word of mouth. You know, recommendations of somebody's cousin goes to the recruiter, and people get recruited that way. Recruiters do use radio stations to recruit. They use Facebook groups. There's a lot of Facebook live streams and Facebook groups um, to recruit new workers, but it is very much a jungle. There's a lot of scam artists involved in Mexico that, you know, are trying to rip people off of thousands of dollars. So it's a hard, it's a very hard system, you know, for the workers to navigate. Yeah, so one thing um, that the bill does have and that we've advocated for in the past and other groups as well is uh, recruit be better transparency and information about international recruiters um, and making sure that the State Department and consulates are, are have that information. Um, and so, yeah, that, that is a piece that's very concerning. Some of you may also be aware with the, of the Contratados website um, that is sort of a, a Yelp for employers and recruiters where people put information, you know, about the experiences that they've had uh, with recruiters and employers, but we do advocate for that to be improved and, and put in as a requirement uh, for folks who are accessing the program. I'm going to chime on in trying to, trying to assist you all with answering the question. Sorry, I didn't jump in here. I want to see if the answer, if it was answered of the question. The question asked is, is it worthwhile for H-2A workers to apply for ACA given the short time they typically work in the U.S.? Yeah, so so I, Bethany, you might have thoughts on this. I think it really depends, right, uh, as the person alluded to in terms of the period. It does begin, they, they do have a special enrollment period that is triggered, so it, it, it likely will make sense if they're staying for any significant period of time, but I think it'll be a very case-by-case -case determination. I would agree, really. I mean, they do they do have workers' compensation insurance, so if they're injured, you know, they will get medical care and paid, you know, paid wages um, from workers' comp. But, 
you know, we're seeing some people stay there for 11 months. And now with some of the changes because of COVID, they might be here even longer. And so in those cases, it might really be worth it. But if they're coming in for just a very short harvest period of two or three months, then, you know, it's really up to the worker. I, but, you know, the system could be better and, and more efficient, probably, that before encouraging workers who are here for such a short time to sign up for health insurance. A comment come, came in from Alexis stating, H-2A workers generally tend to have low premiums due to eligibility for tax credits and subsidies. And there's a, uh, someone repeating a question too about if in the new bill there's any requirement for the employers to provide health coverage. No, there's increased occupational health and safety protections, for example, related to heat stress, but there's nothing directly on health insurance. And we, I would personally love to hear from folks, you know, how, how people are sort of getting the word out to H2A workers in their communities about how to navigate the U.S. healthcare system. You know, how do you call 911? When do you call 911? And we've seen this issue of the bills being a, a tool that employers use to keep people from seeking medical care. So they may say, you know, you need the medical care, but if you go, they're going to stick you with a $20,000 bill. And if you don't pay it, you'll get deported or, you know, all kinds of things. So I'm curious if folks have ideas about how to, um, you know, how they've been getting information out about that to H2A workers. The comment says that they are members of Family Unidas por la Justicia, an independent farm worker union that has been able to help H-2A workers file class action lawsuits in Washington. And also succeed. Another question from Alfonso is, do you have information about how willing are H-2A employers to provide access to the vaccine for their workers, given that traditionally they are not willing to open their farms to health personnel? Yeah, so I'm interested to hear from, from Bethany as well as in terms of what you've been seeing on the ground. I think it's, it's hard to generalize. I, I do get the overall sense that this is one area where employers um, employers and farm worker advocates are on the same page because they want to be able to keep, um, you know, keep their farms operating. And as you all recall, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, particularly in meat processing and some other areas, um, there were some, some pretty serious outbreaks. Um, and so my general sense is, is there's been a little bit more willingness uh, to cooperate when it comes to the vaccine. Uh, but again, I defer to others who've been who've been doing some of that outreach. Yeah, I think it, it depends, but I wouldn't say they haven't been willing to open their farms to health personnel. A lot of them have, you know, had on-site clinics and things like that in certain areas. It's just the COVID thing has changed things a little bit, but historically we have seen a lot of H2A employers having um, mobile units on their farms, especially some of the larger ones. So the vaccine is different, I think, unless, unless the employer is personally anti-vaccine, I haven't been hearing of a lot of resistance to the doing that. And really the opposite is true. There's way more demand than there is availability in terms of mobile units being able to go to farms and offer the vaccine. Comment comes in, in Arizona, the only access to healthcare is the FQCHCs uh, but that is only, excuse me, but that's only if employer insists with information, transportation, and access to care. But another question from Jesse comes in. Any talks about compensating domestic agricultural workers the same as the H-2A program? So car workers in corresponding employment are already required to be paid the same as H-2A workers. Um, that's part of why, for example, our organization has been litigating a case related to the H-2A wage, the AWER that Gabby mentioned before, because it affects H-2A workers, but it also affects all workers um, in terms of the wage level. Um, but Gabby, I don't know if you want to add anything else. 
No, and I mean, the, the AWER is at least technically it's supposed to reflect the average wage that um, that all farm workers are, are making in a certain state. Um, so at least in theory, it's supposed to sort of match the wages that domestic workers are also making. The chat box is being filled with comments uh, back and forth over this topic, y'all. So it's more it's more of a corresponding with this. Hmm. There was one other question, if there's time, but before we wrap up, it's about we have about ten minutes to finish this session. So I want to bring you all back and remind everyone that we need to complete an evaluation. For this session, I'm going to go ahead and post a link on the chat box so everyone can go ahead and click there. We do have this time remaining as well for additional questions and comments. So go ahead and keep putting them in in the chat box. However, do visit the link that I provided. It might get swamped with everyone's input in the chat box, so I'll put it again if you don't find the link. General question here. Um, is what is the stand of both the organizations on proposed legislation? And Jill, I'm not sure if this is for the presenters, uh, but she or if who they're chatting with in the chat here. But the general question is, what is the stand of your organizations on the proposed legislation? So as I mentioned, uh, we support the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. We also support the, support the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021, which colloquially folks will refer to as the Biden immigration bill. There's also a proposal to provide immigration status to essential workers. We've introduced legislation in the past um, regarding labor rights for workers as well, um, and heat stress protections and other OSHA issues. Um, I'm not sure how, how broad uh, that question was meant to be, but um, just wanted to flat that. And I'm sorry, Mario, I lost my connection for a bit, so I missed that, I missed that but we can move on if we need to. Not a problem. The chat is is really talking about uh, the access to to health care services and, and farmers across the state. And it looks like there's discussion going on whether, uh, you know, the responsibility of the farm workers, the legislation coming up, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, I mean, at NCFH, we don't, we're not a policy organization. You know, farm worker justice has much more of a policy bent than we do. We tend to be more focused on training and technical assistance and research. And so there Rarely will we take a stance on a piece of policy, but generally we, we don't. That's just not our focus. Um, there was another really good point in here from Jill that, you know, we expect employers and in other industries to provide health insurance. You know, it, it is frustrating, I agree, but it really isn't limited to just farming. It's really very widespread. You know, this increasing sort of precarious employment that we see in the U.S. where Construction workers don't have workers' comp or health insurance. A lot of retail and service sector workers don't have it either. Um, you know, sadly, it's it's very widespread in farming, but it's also becoming more and more widespread in a lot of other industries. So, um, you know, it's a struggle that that a lot of us focusing on farming and on workers' rights in other industries need, need to be concerned about. And, and on, a, on a broader level, we, we have a health team that works on, on healthcare policy and advocates uh, for increased funding and resources for migrant health centers um, and other types of outreach um, to, to try and fill that gap, um, as well as providing benefits um, to immigrants, which again is, is much broader than just the specific farm worker population, uh, but of course is, is one of the underlying challenges. Yeah, so maybe we can all have some closing statements here. I really want to thank everyone for joining this session. It's such a lively, exciting session to be a part of. And please feel free to email any of us. I'll put my email in the chat if you have follow-up questions. Um, and yeah, just, just let us know, you know if you have other questions or other concerns about H2A workers or things that, that you would like to learn. And we can certainly talk about doing you know, more trainings in the future.
we do just have five minutes. Any last statements or anything else besides the accolades? You all are receiving great accolades, great presentation. And for the audience, you'll see that the emails for the presenters are being posted in the chat. So feel free to save those as well if you want to reach out or have any additional questions. We know how there's a lot more that comes into our mind right after a presentation. Thanks, and I also put in the link to our website. We have on our resource page, um, we have a sub pages on a lot of the different issues that we talked about, immigration, healthcare, and also a COVID resource uh, sub page that might be helpful for folks. Um, so you all can, can na navigate based on, on what you'd like more information on. I guess this is the last question. We do have two minutes. Any chance you can post a link to the website to look up seasonal jobs for H-2A workers that are available? Thank you, Gabby. And it's right there, Gabby just posted it, seasonaljobs.dol.gov. That about wraps it up, everyone. We have about three minutes left. We want to thank all the presenters for their time and for their expertise and, and answering all these questions. This was very lively, so if we didn't get to your questions, feel free to email the presenters. Uh, they are a database of information. And so if you also have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to CVANT if there was something else uh, in the background that you noticed, if you needed some help. Likewise, feel free to remember to complete the evaluation in the link. I'm going to put it one last time here just in case it wasn't seen because like I, as everyone noticed, it was very lively here. I like your idea, your idea, Jesse. I think we should. Fantastic. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording for y'all. If y'all have any last statements, you have one minute. Just again, thanks everybody for joining because um, we know everybody's so busy. Um, and so we really appreciate you taking the time. And if there's any questions we didn't get to or just follow up questions later, please do feel free to reach out to us. As we said, we wanted this to be an interactive session and I think it was <laughs> definitely. Um, so we wanna make sure that, especially with everything going on, we're all uh, knowing what's, what's going on in different areas of the country. Fantastic. Gracias a todos. Thanks, Gabby. Thanks, Iris. Thanks, Jen. And thanks, Bethany.